Cool, thanks guys. Thanks Dean for the prayer. Hey, it was good to see um, Jess and Ethan are sitting out in the uh, youth hall there with a the little baby Adeline, so uh, make sure you get to say hi to uh, that new little addition to the family. Um, so good to see them here this morning. Man, I'd forgotten how hot it gets in this building. Um, the air con is on. Um, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll try and keep my sermon short today, okay, down to at least a couple of hours so that we don't overheat, all right? So um, I think the air con is going, but I know with the doors open, that's a bit tricky. But anyway, um, this morning I'm planning to address a subject that hopefully will keep you awake. Dean just prayed about it, obviously. It's a subject that is um, mentioned actually several times in Scripture and it's a topic that really is essential to the well-being of the local church, and that is the topic of church discipline. And as Dean prayed as well, this message does fit into a, a series that we have been doing over the past few weeks that we have called the DNA of OBC. And it's simply just an opportunity for us to summarize who we are as a church and what we believe in and how we should function and what are our distinctive marks and and even what distinguishes us from every other church in this region. And the catalyst for this series is the elders' desire to put together a formal document called an OBC Constitution, which really will help us as leaders to be able to lead the church because it gives us some guidelines to follow, but also we hope that it will be good for you because you will understand who we are and also helpful for people who may be visiting and perhaps want to get connected with us as a church. And so this is, uh, I think, the seventh message that we've had, and next Sunday will be the eighth, and it'll be the final message in this series. And um, by the way, I just want to say thank you for so many of you who have given me some positive feedback and encouraging comments about this ser um, sermon series. I, I know it's been uh, helpful for, for many, many of you. And so next, next Sunday, just as a preview so you know, we're going to finish with the importance of being fully connected to a local church. God didn't design us to be spectators, he designed us to be participators, and so we'll talk about that, and we'll look at the, the biblical principles associated with belonging to a local church fellowship, and what it means to be a part of the, the church family, and some churches might refer to this as church membership. Um, I don't particularly like the name because I think it carries too much baggage with it, but I certainly I do like the concept because it is 100% biblical to commit yourself, if you're a Christian, to a local church. And so we'll look at that next time. But this morning, we're going to delve into the territory that we call church discipline. And whenever we hear that word discipline, it usually will conjure up in our minds some negative thoughts or maybe a vision of pain and punishment you know, I remember when I was about 13 years old, I was in Form 3 or what is Year 9. These days, I was at Rangitiki College in Martin, and my maths teacher thought it would be appropriate to give me some discipline. And I wasn't so keen on the idea. I was sitting in class one day next to my friend, and we were, I guess we were meant to be doing some calculus or algebra or whatever they do in Year 9 these days. And instead, of, instead me and my friend were having a little fun. Um, it was like a friendly little play fight, which was more enjoyable than maths, and our teacher just happened to walk into the classroom at the exact moment that my friend was sort of leaning over and giving me a friendly, loving punch on the arm, and you might find this a little bit hard to believe, but I'm, I'm so old that I did my schooling back in the dark ages when teachers had access to that weapon called a cane. Remember that? This thing, one and a half meters long, made of bamboo or some, something like that. It was very whippy and stingy and ouchy. <laughs> and I know some of you do remember those days, probably for the wrong reasons, actually. But um, anyway, both of us were marched off to our teacher's office, and we got two of the best on our La Dere year, and that was uh, my discipline in year nine. And I'm guessing that type of discipline must have worked because I didn't get any more stripes in my high school years. But anyway, discipline doesn't bring back good memories, does it, sometimes? Children don't enjoy discipline of any kind, do they? I mean, it's not pleasant. Kids usually think discipline is bad. They think it's mean. No child looks forward to any form of, dis or any form of parental, parental discipline, but it is an essential part of the 
teaching process as a parent. It's an essential part of teaching wisdom to your kids, helping them to develop moral virtues, and ultimately pointing them to Christ, which is the ultimate goal of parenting. And it was Christ himself who took, you could say, the discipline or the punishment for our sin. You know, one of the reasons that families are falling apart and parents have no control over their children is because there is no consistent loving discipline in those homes. One of the reasons why schools are becoming battlefields between teachers and students is because there's a lack of discipline there now. And we know, don't we, that a lack of discipline in the home and a lack of discipline in the schools leads to massive problems in our society because kids are growing up with Little or no respect for authority. And I want to suggest that perhaps one of the reasons why some churches are not the holy institutions that they are meant to be is because there is a lack of church discipline. And so we want to look at that this morning, and I want to break it down into three sections that we'll we'll cover this morning. The first thing I want to look at is the, the purpose of church discipline, the purpose of church discipline. You could say it another way and maybe ask it in a question form, and that is, why should we have church discipline? And I think there's a number of reasons that I'll point out to you, but first of all, before I look at some of those reasons, did you know that God himself practices loving discipline on his children? And he does that in order to keep them on the pathway of righteousness. Hebrews 12 Verses 5 to 11, talk about that. Just listen to these verses in Hebrews 12. It says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he, that is God, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment of discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God is in favor of discipline as you read through this chapter. He, in fact, practices discipline on us, his children. And he has the right to do that. He has the right to discipline us at any time that he thinks we might need it. And you might ask the question, well, how does he discipline us? Well, he executes his discipline in lots of different ways. He might use trials. He might use tests. He might use some kind of various predicaments or circumstances that happen in our lives in order to help us recognize something that we've done wrong and to help us to repent of that sin, whatever it might be. But this passage here in Hebrews 12 certainly gives us a clear understanding of the purpose and the principles of discipline and also church discipline, as we're looking at this morning. As we think about how God disciplines his children, we saw in those verses that it is meant to be a loving action. Discipline is an act of love when it is done rightly. It says there in verse 6, God disciplines those whom he loves. And it's also for our good. Verse 10 there says, God disciplines us for our good. And not only that, it purifies us. It makes us more holy because at the end of verse 10 there that I just read, it says that God wants to share his holiness with us. And then in verse 11, it says that God disciplines us because it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so according to that passage here in Hebrews 12, when God disciplines his children, he does so in order to renew, you could say, our relationship with him 
And his purposes are very clear. He wants to produce in us holiness, and he wants to produce in us righteousness. And so as God disciplines us to get that, the same is true of what we would call church discipline. When discipline is administered in the context of the church between one believer and another believer, the purpose is to bring about repentance and restoration, but also righteousness and holiness. And as I said before, it's so easy, isn't it, to think of discipline as just negative. But that's not how God views discipline. Christian discipline or church discipline is designed to be a positive thing. It's a, it's a good thing, and its ultimate goal is our spiritual growth and our loving restoration and care of a sinning believer. And so another important purpose of church discipline Not only is it to produce in us righteousness and holiness, but it's also to maintain purity in the church. We know, don't we, that the church is the bride of Christ, and Jesus wants his bride to remain pure. We know that passage well in Ephesians 5, where it says there that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, Christ would sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. How does Jesus want to present the church? How does he want to see the church? Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus wants to keep his bride pure. Therefore, he expects a certain standard of holiness in the church. And discipline helps to achieve and maintain that level of holiness in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man in that church in Corinth who was living a sexually immoral life. In fact, he was having an incestuous affair with his stepmother. And the church was just a little bit ho-hum about it. They hadn't done anything about it. And so the Apostle Paul gets on this guy's case, and he urges the church to remove the sinning member from their midst. I mean, this man's blatant sin was putting a dark stain on the purity of the church. The church in Corinth was being very lax about that situation. And so Paul even says to them in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, he says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, he's saying this, one unrepentant sinning member of the church puts a black spot or a black stain on the purity of that whole church. And that's a warning, isn't it, for all of us? And so we've seen... It's a loving act that we should do, that God does towards us at times, but it's to produce holiness, it's to produce righteousness, and it's to protect the the purity of the church. And another aspect, aspect of the purpose of church discipline is that it simply is to restore a sinning Christian, to restore a sinning brother or sister. Because we know, don't we, that sin wrecks our relationship with God and it wrecks our relationship with one another. So Matthew 18 verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother, or you have won your brother is the idea there. And so the purpose of church discipline is restoration. It's to restore a sinning Christian back to the right pathway. The goal of church discipline is never to embarrass somebody. It's never to throw people out of the church. It's never to exercise ungodly power over that person. Biblical discipline or church discipline is not cold-hearted punishment. The goal of church discipline is to restore sinners back to a right relationship with God and a right relationship with one another. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brothers, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, but keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
And so that verse shows us a picture of restoration. And in fact, the, the picture behind the word restoration in Galatians 6.1 is that of mending a net, like a fishing net. If a fishing net is torn, you want to mend it. You want to restore it. That's the, the picture. And it's the same picture behind a broken bone that's, that needs to be set in a cast. That's the idea of restoring it. That's what this word restoration means, to put it back to where it ought to be, to restore it. And there's also another aspect of um, the purpose of church discipline, and that is to instill in the congregation of Christians or in the church a healthy fear of God. 1 Timothy 5 verse 20 says, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In other words, discipline is designed by God to instill in everybody watching on a healthy fear of God. It should create in us a, a healthy respect for God and His holiness and a, and a deeper reverence for who God is and what His character is. You remember that situation in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. I guess you could say that that was probably the first case of church discipline in the church in Jerusalem. I'll read it to you. I think you can follow along. In Acts 5, it says this, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained, un remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. Imagine being in church that day when you see this event take place. After witnessing somebody drop dead because of sin, how many people do you think showed up at church next Sunday with sin in their life? I mean, these guys had lied to the leaders of the church, and they didn't even have to do it. It was like they sold a block of land. Maybe they sold it for $100,000. They put $50,000 under their pillow, and they bought the other $50,000 to church, and they gave it to the church. And Peter said, is that all you got for the land? And they said, yes, it is. They could have just said, we only got, no, it's half of what we got. And they would have been all right, but they lied about it. But it was all done as a sin, but it brought fear upon the people who saw what happened. I'll read the rest of this text here. Verse 6, the young men rose, they wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. In an, in an interval of about three hours, his wife came in. She didn't know what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for, the, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And notice what verse 11 says, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. It's a good way to keep the church pure. Have church discipline like that. But when sin is dealt with appropriately, it does produce a healthy fear in the congregation. A great motivation to deal with sin immediately then, isn't it, as you think of this illustration? And so we've seen a number of purposes of church discipline. It's designed to make us more holy. It's designed to produce righteousness and to restore us if we sin. It's designed to keep the church pure. It's designed to keep or, or to build a reverence, a deep reverence and a deep fear of God. That's the, that's the purpose of church discipline. 
A second thing we want to look at is, well, who, who should be church disciplined? Who are the people who need church discipline? Matthew 18, verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you. The sinning brother. Galatians 6, verse 1 I've mentioned that verse already to you. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. So who needs discipline? And the the simple answer is anyone in the church who has sinned and hasn't yet repented of it should face church discipline. And you might ask the question, what kind of sins are we talking about? Well, it could be any kind of sin, any kind of habitual sin. It could be somebody who's like a compulsive liar. It could be somebody who's just a relentless gossiper. It could be somebody who continually gets drunk. It could be somebody who is violent and physically abusive. It could be for immorality. It could be for gluttony. That's a sin. It could be somebody who has fits of rage and anger and can't control it and doesn't want to confess it. Any of those things could be sins that need disciplining if they're not confessed and repented of. I remember reading a few years ago about a mega church in America. They disciplined hundreds of its members because they hadn't been to church for months and months. (laughs) You don't normally hear about that very often, but they felt like it was a disciplining situation. Hebrews 10 verse 25 says to Christians that we should gather together and fellowship with one another. Other sins that could be disciplined would be if somebody is deliberately or undermining or opposing the doctrine of the church or the direction of the church. I mean, that would be a divisive person that would need to be lovingly disciplined. Sometimes that kind of person will like to to rally up other people who maybe have similar thoughts. And so that kind of divisiveness has potential to wreck a church. And so there's all kinds of sins that do need disciplining. In fact, there's no sin that God wants to have continue in your life unrepented of and confessed. So anyone who has sinned is, or is continually sinning is the person that needs loving church discipline. And that brings us to the third and the final section that we need to think about, and that is the process of church discipline. What does it look like? And I'm going to look at Matthew 18 just for the rest of this time. If you've got your Bible, you can open that open to Matthew 18, or you might be able to follow some of them on the screen. But This chapter is a great chapter. It really outlines for us the procedure that a church should follow when a Christian falls into sin and they're unwilling to repent of it. And the key verses in Matthew 18 are verses 15 to 18. But before we get to 15 to 18, I want to take a little bit of a a look at the wider context of chapter 18 because I think it helps us and it really sheds a little bit more light on the subject. At the very beginning of chapter 18, Jesus is having a a conversation with his disciples. And he's talking to them about the kingdom of God, and, and he's talking to them about who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. In other words, like who is the greatest in God's family? Who's the greatest in God's church? And verse 4 of chapter 18 lays down a very important answer to that question. Jesus says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we must demonstrate humility. We must take humility with us everywhere that we go. So keep that in the back of your mind as we think about church discipline. We need to demonstrate humility. And then in Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9, we're also encouraged to take purity with us everywhere we go. In other words, we are to evaluate our lives, and if we find anything in our life that's causing us to sin, then we are to get rid of it, to remove it immediately. Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9, I'll read these ones to you. It says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life into heaven with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. 
And so these verses are telling us that if we identify sin in our own life, we need to get rid of it as soon as possible, as soon as we possibly can. We need to deal with it radically is what that verse is telling us. Now, do we literally cut our hand off or pluck our eye? I don't think that's what it's meaning, but it's the heart attitude here. If there's sin in your life, deal with it radically before it escalates. John, John Owen once said, you've probably heard me say it before, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So when it comes to personal sin in our own lives, we need to be proactive in conquering it or defeating it. Otherwise, that sin will get a hold of our heart and it will begin to work away and continue to corrupt us. And so as we work through Matthew 18 and we get a little bit closer to verses 15 to 18, the church discipline verses, we've got to remember these things, okay? We've got to remember to take humility with us, to take purity with us. And then when we look at verses 10 to 14 in Matthew 18, they talk about the shepherd, remember, who, who is a faithful shepherd who leaves his 99 sheep behind and he goes after the one sheep that, lo- that is lost. And this is a picture of a shepherd who is loving and compassionate, and he's caring for that one lost sheep of his. And so these are all qualities that we need to take on board in our own lives before we go to start thinking about church discipline and confronting somebody who might be in sin. And so when we go and knock on somebody's door, we certainly want to go with humility. We want to go with purity in our own lives. We want to go with love and, and we want to go with compassion. And then, then we get to verse 15 in Matthew 18, and here is the church discipline process. You could say this is step one in Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, and if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So if you know someone in the church who has committed a sin against you, or it could be any sin that they have committed, because Galatians 6 verse 1 tells us that, and as far as you know that they haven't confessed their sin or repented of it, then it is your responsibility to go to that person in private, with love, with humility, with gentleness, with compassion, with grace, and with kindness, and you are to go alone, don't have any fanfare, no one else needs to know what's happening at this point, it's private and it can remain private, and you go to them and you lovingly confront them, and you point out to them what they've done, maybe it's something they've said, maybe it's something they've done that you believe is a sin against you, And you do it graciously, but you call them to repentance and restoration if they admit to having done the sin. And if he or she repents of that sin, if they acknowledge that they did do the sin and then they repent of it, then you can rejoice. And if they do, the church discipline process comes to a screeching halt. It ends right there. You've won your brother, you've won your sister, or you've gained them, the text says, and you can move on. It's done and dusted. And as you think about this, I mean, in theory, this step one happens all the time. And we don't even necessarily know that it's happening because it just happens behind the scenes. I don't necessarily know about it. You don't necessarily know about it. It just happens between Christians in the church as they seek to reconcile with each other. And maybe even as we think about this, we need to ask ourselves the question, do I... Do I love my brothers and sisters in the church enough to go to them and confront them if I know they're sinning? Am I willing to do that? Do I love them enough? Remember, this is a loving thing to do. It's not a a bad thing. It's a good thing. However, if you go to this person and they don't respond positively at all, there's there's a second step that it says we should follow here in Matthew 18, verse 16. It says... But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, this doesn't mean that you quickly call up a couple of your friends and you head back to this person and go and visit them again in 30 minutes. That's not the idea here. There's no 
specific time period between step one and step two. In fact, patience is a virtue, and we should be patient, and this process could take days or weeks maybe between step one and step two. But in this step, it says here that we had to take two or three witnesses with us. Now, these extra witnesses, they are there to ensure the truthfulness of what's happened and the accuracy of the situation. These witnesses didn't necessarily have to have viewed the person sinning, but they certainly would view the confrontation and the communication and conversation that happens in that confrontation. And they can also confirm that a sin has occurred and is perhaps still occurring. And when you take two or three others with you, it sort of like ups the ante, doesn't it? It's sort of like a, a, um, a visual portrait of the seriousness of the sin and of the situation. I mean, if you're still at school as a student and you get called into the principal's office and the principal's there and a teacher is there and your parents are there, you know that's a pretty serious situation, right? And that's kind of the idea here. It's, it's pointing out the, the seriousness of what's going on. But obviously, again, the hope is that the sinning party will have a change of heart and that they would confess their sin and repent of it. Because remember, the goal is always restoration. It's always to produce righteousness, and it's always to protect the purity of the church. It's not to belittle the person or embarrass them in any way. And as we think about this process, I mean, we do need to remind ourselves, don't we, that sin is a serious issue to God. It's a serious issue. It was sin that put Jesus on the cross. In fact, you could say it was sin that murdered Jesus. It was sin that separated God from his son. The only time he had ever been separated from him was because of sin. And it was sin that caused God to forsake his son and abandon him for a period. I mean, sin is a, a serious issue to God. It's not a trivial issue. You can't be, you can't be flippant about sin. It's, you could say it's irresponsible and it's unacceptable for a Christian to live in unrepentant sin. Because Jesus has already died for that sin. He's already suffered the wrath of God for that sin. So why would we want to remain living in it? We shouldn't do that. Sin is a serious issue to God. Now, if there's no response to two or three witnesses going to see this person, then Matthew 18, verse 17, talks about another step. We could call it step three. It says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, at this point, the matter is obviously raised with the leadership of the church. And after a period of time, they would initiate what we call here step three. Now, I was first introduced to this form of church discipline when Natalie and I were living in Los Angeles. There were some occasions when the pastor of the church would stand up, usually during a time of communion, and he would say something like this to the congregation. He would say, Beloved, it is with sadness that I inform you about our brother, whatever his name is, Johnny Brown or whoever it might be, our brother who has chosen to remain in his sinful pattern of living. The church leadership have pleaded with Johnny to repent, yet he is unwilling. Please pray for him and take the opportunity to lovingly call him to repentance. And I heard that a few times when we were living in, the Los, in Los Angeles. And so at this point in the process, the sin has become sort of public, public knowledge. Not all the details are put out there, but just it is put out there that this person hasn't repented of their sin and it becomes a church-wide issue. And the purpose for that is that the church would pray for this individual and that they would encourage him or her to put their life right with God. And by the way, the, the discipline process is not just for the congregation or the people in the church. The Bible talks about a discipline process for leaders in the church as well. In 1 Timothy verses, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, it says there in the context of a leader who is sinning, it says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. And so these verses are speaking about a public rebuke, even for a leader in the church who may be sinning. And that public rebuke is essentially the same kind of format as step three here in Matthew 18. And then notice what happens. If there's still no repentance, then Matthew 18, verse 18, sort of talks about a final step. We could call this step four. It says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And you might ask the question, well, what does it mean to treat somebody as a Gentile and a tax collector? And there's been a little bit of debate about what this particular statement means. Some people would say that this means that you completely excommunicate this person. You kick them out, and you have absolutely nothing more to do with this person. And the reasoning for that, they would say, is that the Jews hated and they despised tax collectors and Gentiles, and therefore the church must treat the unrepentant sinner just like that. Ignore them, kick them out, excommunicate them, ostracize them, turn your back on them. That's how some people view this verse. Personally, I don't view it that way. I would rather understand it this way. To treat somebody as a Gentile and a tax collector is simply saying that we're now going to treat them as an unbeliever, as, a, as an outsider, you might say. And this view is based on the occasions in Matthew's gospel. Remember when Jesus met with tax collectors and with Gentiles? He didn't excommunicate them when he met with them. He was kind to them. He was gracious to them. He just treated them as unbelievers, but he was kind and gracious to them. And so when we treat a person as a tax collector and as a Gentile, that means that the person would forfeit their rights as, or forfeit their privileges and their blessings and their benefits of being associated with a local church. They would be removed from membership if there was a formal membership or any official records. They wouldn't be allowed to participate in communion as we have done this morning. They wouldn't be able to serve in a ministry role in the church. They wouldn't be able to enjoy the intimacy and the fellowship that we as Christians have. And so the idea is that you treat them like an outsider, like an unbeliever, and not like a close family member. And when you think about Matthew 18 and its wider context, as I've been talking about, whatever view you take regarding the meaning of this phrase, treat them like a tax collector and a Gentile, we, we do know this from Matthew 18, that if someone is unwilling to repent of their sin, if they want to just keep sinning and live in that sin and they don't want to deal with it, we know this from Matthew 18, that they fail the humility test, which was the first four verses of that chapter. An unrepentant person is not a humble person. They're driven by pride. And Jesus said, unless you possess humility, you won't be a citizen in God's kingdom. So they fail the humility test. They're not in God's kingdom in that sense. And also, they fail what we call the purity test. Because they haven't cut off the particular sin in their life and thrown it from them. They're causing themselves to stumble. And so Jesus says in verse 8 and 9 of Matthew 18, those who don't deal with their own personal sin, if you don't cut off and be radical with sin in your life, Jesus says you're on your way to hell. And you're not a citizen of God's kingdom. So anyone who's unrepentant, any, anyone who claims to be a Christian, but they're unrepentant and living in unrepentant sin, they're living like an unbeliever. And so based on those sections in Matthew 18, their unwillingness to repent shows that they are not true citizens of God's kingdom, and therefore they should be treated as such. And I think that's what Jesus is meaning by that statement. And if we follow this process outlined here by Jesus, then he has promised that he is in the midst of it, and the final outcome is rubber stamped in heaven. And that's what verses 18 to 20 are referring in Matthew 18. Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two, or you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. 
For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And so Jesus summarizes this passage on church discipline with these words here. And by the way, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst, that has nothing to do with a church prayer meeting. (laughs) And it has everything to do with God affirming the church discipline process. Whenever a church follows this discipline procedure, it has God's blessing on it. He is part of that process. God, Jesus says, I am there in the midst of that process. And maybe a footnote, footnote to all of this. I mean, some people might ask the question, well, how, how fast does this process go? Well, I would say it depends on the circumstances and the situation. It may take months and months. It might be just a matter of a few short weeks or even days, maybe. It might start off private and be resolved privately, as I said, which is obviously a great thing if that happens. But if someone is creating a lot of havoc and a lot of devastation in a church, that would require immediate action because we want to protect the purity of the church. We want to protect the testimony of the church, and we certainly want to protect the sheep in the church. And as I said earlier, if somebody is, for example, actively propagating false doctrine against the, the saints or among the saints, then it is like, that is likely to create a whole lot of other problems that need to be dealt with rapidly. Likewise, if there is a divisive person in the church who is fighting against people in the church or maybe even the leadership of the church, that's going to cultivate a real problem. And so it needs to be dealt with a lot quicker than perhaps other situations. But oftentimes these can be slow processes and we want to be gracious and we want to be patient and we want to be kind. And just maybe one other little footnote as well as we're thinking about this. If someone commits a sin, someone in the church commits a sin and it is also a criminal act under New Zealand law, then we as leaders are obligated to report that offence to the legal authorities. So there will not only be a possible court case coming up for that person, but there will also be the church discipline process that would happen in the church. So that's kind of like a a quick summary of the church discipline process. We've looked at the purposes, we've looked at the people, we've looked at the, the actual process of it. Now this is all the theory. Does anyone want to volunteer for the practical? I'm just kidding. You know, it's a, this is something obviously that we don't like doing and we don't want to do. And we hope we don't have to really do this at all because we want you to be looking at your own heart and dealing with sin in your heart before it becomes inflamed and spreads and, and affects people in the church. And so my advice is certainly, you know, evaluate your own heart. Evaluate issues that maybe you're dealing with in your own life and and cut off those things that may be slowing you down or tripping you up. And, and likewise, um, for those of you, as Galatians 1 says, are spiritual, which is really just those of you who are wanting to obey God and please the Lord, if you do see a brother or sister in Christ that's stumbling and perhaps needs your loving help, then don't be afraid to go to them with all those principles that we talked about and, and help them. I mean, we want to have a church that honors God, right? And a church that is pure is a church that honors the Lord. And and we strive for that, and we certainly want that to be true of this church. And you know what? If you struggle, we, we all struggle with sin. I get that. And if you're struggling with sin and you need help with that, then we want to help you too. We've got people who can come alongside and encourage you and support you and, and to help you work through some of those uh, temptations and battles that, that are sometimes a little bit harder to, to win Uh, win the war over. So come and see us if you need any help with that. But let's bow our heads and we'll ask the Lord to help us to to put these things into practice and the guys will come up and we'll finish with a song. Father, we just again want to pray that you would help us to listen to your word and not only listen to it, Lord, but let it be affecting our hearts and changing us to be more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, give us grace to be able to deal with these matters in a way that pleases you. Lord, I pray for all of us listening to this message today, myself included. Lord, help us to be able to 
just evaluate our own hearts and our own lives. And if there's things that need changing, Lord, help us to change. If there's things that need cutting off, help us to cut them off. We desire to please you. We desire to honor you in the way that we live. So we pray that you'd help us to do that. Help us to be pure. Help us to be holy. We know you've called us to be holy as you are holy, and that's certainly our desire. So, Lord, help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name.